There's almost 72 million people today that receive Social Security benefits. Uh, Social Security program is our largest federal program. It's a $1.4 trillion budget. 20% uh, of uh, all federal spending is going into Social Security. The Social Security program is actually broken down into five different types of benefits. Uh, each of those types of benefits has its own criteria, its own qualifications, and its own amounts that are paid out. So in this video, what I'm going to look at is those five different types of Social Security to make sure that you're getting the most that you can get. Now, the five different types of Social Security benefits include retirement benefits, spousal benefits, ex-spousal benefits, survivor benefits, which would be widower or widower, as well as disability benefits. We're going to look at all of them. But I'm going to begin by talking first off about just the retirement benefits, uh, which is about 85% of all those receiving Social Security are getting this type of benefits. The first thing is qualifications. How do we qualify? Well, we have to have worked uh, at least 10 years and paid into uh, the Social Security tax system. Uh, 10 years, and they actually call this 40 quarters. Uh, we can get no more than four quarters in a year, so we have to work 10 years to be able to actually qualify for retirement benefits. All right, now what's next, once we know we qualify, we have to calculate our own for retirement age. We have to determine that because that will uh, decide how much of a benefit we're going to uh, get. Is that going to be reduced because we take early, or is it going to be actually increased because we take at a later date? So we always have to start with full retirement age. That's the first factor. So the way this works, anyone born between 1943 and 1950, 54 has a full retirement age of 66 and zero months. Okay, right at 66. Now, what they started doing, they, the Social Security Department started doing, was adding two months to everyone's full retirement age once we hit 1955. So in 1955, we have a full retirement age of 66 and two months. 1956, they added four months. 1957, they added uh, six months. Uh, 1958, they added eight months. And then 1959, uh, they added 10 months. And then what happens? Anyone that is born 1960 thereafter has a full retirement age of 67. Now, I am shooting uh, this video today. It's actually March uh, the 27th of 2024. All right, so let's just say somebody is turning 65 today. That means they were born uh, 327, 1959. Okay, they're turning 65 today, eligible for Medicare. So how would we calculate for retirement age for someone with that birthday? Well, we already know that they're born in 1959, so their full retirement age is 66 and 10 months. So the way we do that, we know that they're going to hit their 66th birthday of 327 of 2025. Uh, uh, but they're not yet full retirement age because we have to add 10 months to that. So here's how that is counted. We would count that by saying uh, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January. So that means 1-1 of 2026, that would be that person's full retirement age, 66 and 10 months. So that's the first thing you have to do is calculate that retirement age. That's also called normal retirement age. So once we've calculated our full retirement age, now let's talk about how Social Security is actually going to calculate our monthly benefits. So here's what happens. They are going to take the top 35 years of our earnings. Now, by the way, if you've only worked 25 years, you're going to have some zeros in there because they're going to take 35 years. And then what they're going to do is they're going to apply that to an index. This is actually a wage index uh, to bring those monies current because what I made 20 years ago, uh, because of inflation, all that number needs to be brought forward to uh, you know current value. So they index our top 35 years of earnings uh, up to uh, age 60. And then what they do is they take this uh, total amount, okay, of 35 years, uh, and I'm going to keep it real simple. Uh, let's say this total amount was uh, $2,100,000, okay? So top 35 years, so this is our total earnings that we have. And then they're going to divide that by 420 months, uh, which is that 35 years. And then that number is going to be what they call our average index monthly earnings, Okay? It's not our check yet, it's just average uh, index monthly earnings. Now, I've done the math in advance to make it simple, but 2.1 million divided by 420 is going to give us $5,000. Okay, $5,000. So that's our average indexed up monthly earnings, $5,000. Then they take that, that amount and then they apply that to what we call bend points. And the reason they call them bend points because when you see this on a graph, they're bending. 
And so what we have is we have bend points. There's actually three of them. So the first bend point, and just so you know, these bend points do change on an annual basis. The first bend point this year is uh, 1174. The second bend point is 7078. Um, and then anything above that. So what this means, this first bend point is, of the first $1,174 uh, of this $5,000, uh, they are going to give us a credit of 90% of that amount. Okay? Then anything between $1,174 and $7,078, uh, we are actually going to get 32% of that as part of our Social Security check. Now, in my example, this person didn't have any money above that. And so if there is an amount that's above that, someone that's higher earn earner, uh, then they actually get 15% of that amount. Okay, and so let's look at what this Social Security check is going to be. So let's take the 1174. We know we're going to get 90% of that, which amounts to $1,056.60. And then we're going to get the difference between 5000 and 1174 is actually $3,826, and we get 32% of that as credited. So that's going to be $1,224 and 32 cents. Okay, 32. So we have nothing here, so that's going to be in the zero column because we weren't above the 778, and that's going to be zero. All right, and so then we have those two amounts put together, 105,660, and this gives somebody a Social Security check of $2,280.92. Okay, and this is the amount that they would receive if they uh, go to full retirement age. That's why I said it's important to calculate that. And they call this amount your PIA. And that stands for Primary Insurance Amount. Okay? Now, what happens is if I take, and I'll teach you a little bit more about this later, if I take my Social Security benefits before my uh, full retirement age, uh, my primary insurance amount then is, will be the basis, but they're going to reduce that if I take it earlier. If I wait and go beyond full retirement age, they start with the primary insurance amount, and then they add percentages to that. And again, I'll explain that here in just a few minutes. But I want to make sure you understand, this is the key factor we're looking for, is that primary insurance amount, the amount of Social Security benefits that we will get, at full retirement age. All right, that now brings us to the second type of Social Security benefit, and that is called spousal benefits. And what we mean by this is that this is someone uh, that's a spouse of a worker's work record, those top 35 years of that worker's um, uh, records that are going to be used to calculate the spousal benefit. This means that worker is still alive. We'll see this in a few minutes with the survivor benefits. Uh, may get from a spouse, but that spouse is deceased. We call that survivor or widow or widow benefits. This one means the spouse that we're drawing from is alive, okay? And we're going to use their work record. Now, here's what you got to keep in mind. We have a rule called the deeming provision. And what that means, it says this. Today, when someone applies for Social Security, and let me, let me clarify this. If someone's born after January 1st, 1954, because those born before that fell under a different system. So now, if we're born after January 1st, 1954, deeming provision says that if you apply for uh, Social Security benefits, you're deemed to uh, uh, be applying for everything that you're eligible for. And so, therefore, you have to take the greatest amount that's available to you. Okay, that's the deeming provision. So if a person um, is applying for spousal, what that assumes is that their spousal benefit is going to be greater than what they would get on their own work record. If their own work record is going to be more, they're not going to get spousal. They're going to have to take from their own work record, meaning their own retirement benefit. All right, so that's the deeming provision. So it applies today. Anyone born after January 1st, 54. So qualifications to be able to take spousal benefits. Um, by the way, just so you know, and I'm going to teach you more a little bit, uh, a little bit later about this, but it's basically maxed out at 50% of what that worker's full retirement age benefit would be. So let's explain. Let's say uh, I'm going to draw from my spouse and their, their primary insurance amount at their full retirement age is $2,500. Okay, The most I would get would be $1,250 as a spousal benefit. And again, if my own retirement is more, I'm going to have to take that higher amount. But if it, my retirement is less, then I'm eligible for this. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to get that because it just depends on when you apply. Uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, if we apply early, we're going to take a, a less of a benefit. But my point is, that's the spousal benefit, $1,250 if I went to full retirement age. All right, so in order to qualify for spousal benefits, what's, what happens is this. Uh, number one, your spouse 
spouse, that worker that you're drawing benefits from, has to be taking Social Security. <laughs> if they're not, you're not eligible. So they have to actually be taking those benefits. Uh, in addition to that, you have to be married for one year or longer to be able to draw those benefits. And of course, you personally are going to have to be at least 62. Now, if you take a 62, you're going to take a reduced benefit, but that's how you're eligible. All right. And so the spouse has to be taking, had to be married a year, approved by a marriage license, as well as you have to be eligible at 62. All right. So that's the qualifications. Now let's talk about the third type of benefits, and this would be ex-spousal benefits. And again, the deeming provision still applies. If your own account is more, you're going to have to take that. Cannot get from your ex-spouse. But if yours is less, then again, we can actually take from the ex-spouse. Rules are a little bit different. So first off, here's the way it looks. First of all, they're going to look at the length of your divorce. <laughs> In other words, uh, how long have you been divorced? So the rules are, if you've been uh, divorced less than two years, less than two years, uh, your spouse, that your ex-spouse that you're drawing from must be taking. They have to be. Now, uh, if uh, you've been married, um, uh, you've been divorced more than two years, more than two years, doesn't matter whether they're taking or not. Okay, it's, it's not an issue whatsoever. Uh, but if it's less than two years, they have to be taking their own Social Security benefits. So uh, you got to keep that in mind. Now, uh, as far as qualifications, uh, if you're divorced, you had to have a marriage that lasted 10 years or longer and you did not remarry prior to the age of 60. Because if you remarried prior to the age of 60 and you're still married to that spouse, you cannot go back to the ex-spouse. Now, if you remarried after 60 or uh, you're divorced now from that, uh, from that, you know, because that second marriage is ended in a, div a divorce or death, now you can still go back to uh, the previous spouse. All right. So 10 years of marriage, we proved that with, with of course, a, a divorce uh, a decree. Uh, and so as long as we're single or we remarried after 60, now we can go back to them. All right. And so those those are the rules. Of course, you yourself have to be, you know, 62 to be able to draw those benefits. And again, you would take a reduced benefit, but those are the qualifications to draw from that ex-spouse. Hey, if you found this video helpful and if you want to see more Medicare information just like it, then go below, right below the video, and you can give us a thumbs up as well as subscribe to our channel. And every time I put a new video, which is about two every week, you'll be notified of that video and others just like you who need this vital information will get it as well. All right. That brings us now to the fourth type of Social Security benefit, and that would be considered to be survivor benefits. This would be widow or widower benefits. Uh, this means that you're drawing benefits off of a, another person's work record, uh, but they have passed away. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about the deeming provision because this is one area where the deeming provision does not apply. I'm going to emphasize that. Deeming provision does not apply. Okay. Which means what? It means that you can go ahead and apply for uh, survivor benefits uh, based upon the criteria, of course, um, and it will uh, not have any impact upon you having to take the greatest amount available because your own work record uh, may be greater than the uh, deceased spouse, but it doesn't matter because deeming provision doesn't apply. Another aspect about this, because deeming provision does not apply, uh, you can actually take survivor benefits and your own personal retirement benefit uh, will continue to grow. It'll keep growing and keep growing and you can max that at age 70 and then switch uh, benefits from survivor uh, over to your own retirement benefits. So that's really a really wonderful blessing uh, when it comes to uh, survivor benefits. So again, deeming provision does not apply whatsoever. So how do we qualify to get survivor benefits? Well, here's the way the system works. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about a spouse who dies while married. <laughs> words, you're married to them and they die. All you have to do, of course, you have to be at least 60 unless you're uh, raising dependent children. You can be younger then, but let's call it for now, age 60. Uh, your marriage had to last for at least nine months or more. <laughs> And that person, of course, had to have their own 40 cores. They had their own, their own work record for you to be able to draw benefits from them. So those are the only criteria. And, of course, you're going to have to prove all this uh, with a death certificate. You have to prove marriage, of course, with a marriage license. And so those are the criteria if that person died while you're married to them. All right. Now, if uh, you're, uh, that person is now deceased, but you were married to them. Now, watch this. If you're married to them for at least 10 years, kind of like the divorce rule was, 10 years or more, and again, you didn't remarry prior to the age of 60. Uh, if you did, if that marriage ends in death or divorce, then you can go back. But if you're still married to that person that you remarried prior to age 60, 
cannot get ex-spousal. All right, so as long as we're eligible for that, and again, uh, you're personally at least 60 uh, years old. You prove the marriage had lasted for at least 10 years with the divorce decree. Again, you're going to supply a death certificate. Now you can apply even for that ex-spouse. Even if they died after you're divorced, it doesn't matter. You're still eligible to go back. And again, that deeming provision is not going to apply. You're actually eligible. Why? Because of that 10 years of marriage. Now, before we get into the last type of benefit, which is disability, there's something that's very, very critical for you to understand. And that is the four types of benefits I just talked about, which were retirement benefits, um, spousal benefits, ex-spousal benefits, as well as survivor benefits, whether it's present or uh, ex-spouse. There's two very important rules that you have to be mindful of. The first rule is this. The benefits that you receive uh, will be reduced if you take those benefits prior to your own full retirement age. Okay, now we said that uh, we're looking at the work record uh, of our own, we're looking at the work record of a present spouse or an ex-spouse or a present uh, spouse I was married to that died or an ex-spouse that passed away. Okay, so, that was, so when we're looking at someone else's work record, uh, we're going to look at our own work record. But anytime we take any of those four benefits we talked about and we take it before our full retirement age, those benefits are going to be reduced. All right, and so let's do this. So the way it works is this. Uh, let's, let's look first, first at our own retirement benefits. Let's say that my full retirement age uh, was what we talked about earlier. It was 1-1-2026. Uh, Remember, this is someone born today. Uh, we said their birthday was 3-27-1959. Uh, they had a full retirement age of 66 in 10 months, and they hit that 1-1-2026. So if they begin receiving those benefits any time prior to that particular month, they're going to take less. Okay, it's real simple to know this. It's 0.5% per month that you take early. So what's that mean? On my own retirement benefits, if I take early, I'm going to lose 6% a year. Now, my full retirement age, because I was born in 1961, is actually 67. Remember, anyone born after 1960 thereafter has a full retirement age of 67. So if I would have taken my benefits at age 62, and I did not uh, do that, uh, I took them five years earlier. So what does that mean? Five years times six would mean what? I would have got a reduction of 30%. So if I was eligible for, let's say, $3,000 a month in Social Security benefits, uh, if I take it 62, uh, I would have lost $900, okay? And some people decide that they want to take early. But when we take early, regardless of the benefit, those all four types, we're going to take less. It's going to be reduced uh, if we take before our full retirement age. That's why I'm saying it's so significant that you know that, all right? So that's our own retirement benefits. We lose a half a percent a month. The same thing is going to be true if you decide to take take um, uh, survivor benefits. Uh, you're going to lose a half a percent a month if you take early. I don't like that rule, but that's exactly the way that it works. So that's the reduction when it comes to uh, retirement benefits as well as survivor benefits. But uh, there's a greater uh, reduction if you take spousal or ex-spousal benefits, meaning we're drawing from someone, a spouse that's still alive, ex or present. And so that's a greater amount. So let's go back to my example. We said someone's date of birth, 32759, had a full retirement age of 1 one 2026. All right. So if I take that spousal, ex-spousal benefit before then, I'm going to get less. I'll show you how much that is. I want to remind you real quickly. Now, my actual benefit base begins um, uh, at, at the amount that my spouse or ex-spouse is getting at their full retirement age. Even if they took early, it doesn't matter. They're going to look at their full retirement age benefit. So let's just say that benefit was $2,500. Uh, we know the maximum benefit would be $1,250. However, if we take early, that benefit's going to go down. And so here's the way that works. It's actually a fraction of 25 30 seconds, you do the math on that, that's about 0.78% reduction every month, uh, and that's going to be 9.375 for, watch this now, for the first 36 months, okay? And if I take even uh, prior to that, like five years early, then it's 5% reduction uh, for the next uh, 24 months, okay? So that's the way that's going to work. And so let's do the math on that just real quickly. So we've got 9.375% three years, and then we have a 5% reduction for the next two years, okay? And so what's going to happen is that benefit at 50% is going to be reduced. So let's do that. So we said it's $1,250. I'm going to lose that percentage. And so my benefit is actually going to be 
$773.43, right? The difference was that reduction because I decided to take early, all right? And so here's my whole point. Whenever you decide to take any of these four types of benefits you take early, you're gonna take less. All right, the second rule that you have to be aware of, it's a huge one, and that is this. Your benefits are subject to earnings tests. So anytime we take benefits prior to full retirement age, we take less. And also, we're going to be subject to the earnings test. So the earnings test means that if I'm taking Social Security before full retirement age, uh, if I'm still working, uh, then uh, that, that those working wages could have an impact upon my Social Security benefits. All right. And so uh, what we have is we have what we call the low earnings test and we have the higher amount earnings test. So we have a higher amount earnings test. Now, I want to clarify something. When I talk about earnings test, the only thing they're testing that's going to have an impact upon your Social Security benefit are your working wages, not your spouse's, just yours, your salary, your commissions, uh, your net self-employment income. That's all that counts. They're not going to test uh, pension income, annuity income, distributions from your IRAs, 401ks, uh, rental income, investment income. None of that is tested, just working wages because you're saying, yeah, I'm going to take retirement benefits. So if you're still working, there could be an impact. All right, so let's talk about these amounts. Now, again, these amounts change every year, so this is 2024. The low number this year is $22,320 for the year. The higher amount this year is $59,520 for, uh, for the year. Okay? All right, so let me just give you a, a quick example. Let's say that someone was born, I'm going to give you a different one this time. Let's say someone was born 327, and they were born not 1959, but 1958. So full retirement age is what? 66 and eight months. And so what happens here? Let's, let's calculate this together. So we know uh, 327 of 1954, uh, they actually turned uh, 66, but we have to add eight months to that. So how are we going to do it? Uh, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. They would hit their full retirement age 11 1 of 2024. Uh, later this year, okay? So I just want to give you a different example. So we have 11 one 20, So here's what happens. We know that a person born 327, 1958, actually could have started taking Social Security when they turned 62, which would have been 3 one 20, 20. And they're subject, if they take early, for this lower earnings test from 3 one 20, 20 all the way up until December, December of 2023. Okay, so if they're still working, the most they can make is 23, uh, 2, 3, 20 between these months here from 62 up until December before, before they actually turn um, uh, full retirement age. And so for every $2 that they make above that amount, a dollar is coming out of their check. Let's keep it simple. So every two above, they take a dollar out. So let's just say they're um, uh, $8,000 above. So they actually have $30,320. So every $2 above, they take a dollar out of my check. So if I'm 8,000 above, they're gonna withhold $4,000 of social security checks. So let's say someone's getting a $2,000 a month benefit. They're actually gonna withhold uh, two months of social security checks before they turn on the benefits. And this is why you have people say, I don't get my first check till April. I don't get my first check till July. Why? Because the earnings test, they're withholding that money. They front load that money. Once you've set that money aside through this penalty, then they turn on your social security benefits. All right. Then we have uh, a higher number. All right. Now this higher number goes into effect. Now watch this. Full retirement age month, 11 one 20, 24. So the year I turn full retirement age, I'm not there yet, it's just a year I'm turning. What they do is they raise the number. So in our example, this would be 1-1-2024 all the way up until the month before. So this is gonna be 10 of 2024. So during this period of time, now I can make 59,520. And it's, it's, a, it's a, an annual number. So whether I work two months, eight months, 10 months, doesn't matter, I can still make 59,520. They don't prorate that. They just say, here's the amount you can make th during this year. So during this period of time, if I make above 59,520, for every $3 above, they take a dollar out. So uh, uh, they, they withhold less of the percentage, and now I can make substantially more. All right, so that's the higher amount. It only applies to the year I'm turning. But once I hit the month of my full retirement age, here's what happens, folks. The earnings test goes away. 
because now I can make as much money as I want through work, uh, have my own employment, uh, and it has no impact whatsoever upon uh, my Social Security benefits. And that's why people that are uh, continue to work, if they're going to take Social Security, they got to be mindful of this earnings test is going to be applicable. Hey, Medicare can be very confusing. In fact, people make mistakes all the time because of how confusing it is. So what I've done is I've actually created a Medicare, notice this, Essentials Workshop, where you have the opportunity to really learn everything that you need to know about Medicare so that you can make Medicare decisions. There are thousands of people every month that watch this workshop, and we get lots of reviews saying that this is something that really, really uh, was helpful to them. And so what you can do is down here below in the comments section, you'll see where it says pinned comment. At the very top of those pinned comments is a link. And you click on that link. What we're going to do is we're going to give you free access to this Medicare Essentials Workshop. And we want you to watch it because we don't want you to make any mistakes. All right, that brings us then to the last type of Social Security benefits, which would be disability benefits. And so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at how someone qualifies for this because there is a process that's involved as well. So I'm actually going to read some things to you here that I hope will be very helpful for you. So what we're talking about is qualifying for Social Security uh, disability benefits. So first off, how do you qualify? Well, there's a couple of areas that are very important. Number one, they're going to ask you this. They're going to say you must have worked in jobs that were covered by Social Security meaning uh, you've been paying into the Social Security tax system. And secondly, you have to have a medical condition that meets Social Security's strict definition of disability. Okay, and I'm going to exactly tell you what that is here in just a few minutes. But they go on to say this in general, we, Social Security, pays monthly benefits to people who are unable to work for a year or more because of that disability. Generally, there's a five-month waiting period, and then we'll pay your first benefit the sixth full month after the date that we find that your disability began. All right, so again, the criteria, uh, you had to be working, uh, uh, and uh, that was, uh, you know, Social Security taxes were being paid, and then you have this definition of the disability. Okay, now let's talk about that. They say this, in addition to meeting our definition of disability, you must have worked long enough and notice this, recently enough under Social Security to qualify for disability benefits. So the number of work credits you need to qualify for disability benefits depends on your age when that disability began. Generally, you need 40 credits, just like we talked about earlier, 10 years worth of work. 20 of which, though, were earned in the last 10 years, uh, ending with the year your disability began. So it's got to be fairly recent. However, younger workers may qualify with fewer credits, and they have a chart for that. I won't get into those details. All right. Right. Now, first thing we have to deal with now that we realize how we qualify for, what does it mean, though, by a disability? Remember, they said uh, they have a very specific definition, so here's what it means. The definition of disability under Social Security is different than other programs. We pay only for total disabilities, so no benefits are payable for partial or short-term disabilities, as would be maybe through company type of disability plans. We consider you to have a qualifying disability under our rules if the following are true. Listen to this. Now, you cannot do work at the substantial gainful activity, substantial gainful activity, they use the acronym SGA, <clears throat> you cannot uh, work at that level because of your medical condition, number one. Number two, you cannot do work you did previously or adjust to other work because of your medical condition. And then the third criteria, your condition has lasted or is expected to last for at least one year or to result in death. All right, so the question is, how do we decide if you have a qualifying disability? There's actually five different questions that are asked. Let me put them up here on the board real quickly. So the first one has to do with this. Are you working? Are you working? And here's what they say about that. We generally use earning guidelines to evaluate whether your work activity is substantial gainful activity, SGA. So if you're working in 2024 this year and your earnings average more than $1,550 a month, uh, uh, you cannot generally be considered to have a disability. So that's why they ask, are you working? How much are you making? Now, if you're blind, that number's more. If you're blind, you can make up to $2,590. Can't exceed that, but if I stay below that, then again, I'm gonna be able to answer uh, question number one appropriately. Then they say, if you're not working, or are working but not performing substantial gainful activity, we will send your application to the Disability Determinations uh, Office. This office will make the decision about your medical condition. So question number one, it's all about are you working, how much money you're making. So if we say I'm below the 1550 um, uh, and I, I can't uh, you know, continue to work or uh, gain this substantial uh, uh, type of income, now we can go to question number two. All right, so let's look at that question. Second question is, is your condition severe? 
severe. We put it in quotes because they do as well. And here's what they mean by that. Your condition must significantly limit your ability to do basic work-related activities, such as lifting, standing, walking, sitting, or remembering. Okay, and this condition must last for at least 12 months. Uh, if it does not, we will find that you do not have a qualifying disability. So they say, they say it's not severe based upon our standards. We're not going to go on. Uh, your application will be, will be denied. Okay, so he says if your condition does interfere, it does interfere with basic working related activities. Now we can go then to question number three. Is your condition found in the list of disability uh, conditions? All right, so I'm going to clarify this. Here's what they say for each of the major body systems. In fact, let me just read what those are. What they mean by that are these would be musco musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, uh, special senses and speech, respiratory, cardiovascular, digestive, uh, something that's called uh, genitourinary uh, disorders, uh, hematological, skin, and, uh, and, and endocrine systems, uh, congenital disorders, um, uh, neurological, mental, uh, cancer, malignant neoplastic diseases, and immune system disorders. That's what we're talking about. So there's a, a criteria of 14 of these, and of course a lot of subsets within these 14 criteria. All right, that's the list. So they're saying this. For each of the mo major body systems, which I just read to you, we maintain a list of medical conditions that we consider severe enough to prevent a person from doing substantial gainful activity. Okay? If, if it is, we will find that you have a qualifying disability, meaning if you're within this list, then they're saying uh, we're, we're, we're um, uh, fine uh, to give you disability. Uh, and if, if uh, not, then what happens is then this, this is going to stop. In other words, we, do, we don't go on. So let's, let me tell you a couple things that they will do. Uh, some disabilities are uh, immediately apparent uh, that you qualify, and they call these compassionate allowances. So these are situations when people are qu qualifying for disability. Uh, they could have acute leukemia. They could have Lou Gehrig's disease. They could have pancreatic cancer, a variety of things here, and they immediately are going to approve you. Okay, you apply, you'll be approved. They have a, a process they call quick disability determinations uh, where they actually do computer screening to identify those cases where there's a high probability of allowance. In other words, they expedite uh, these kind of cases. All right, so if uh, we can say yes to this question here, uh, then we keep moving on. Now, again, if it's something real severe, uh, they'll, they'll approve it. But we don't have approval yet unless it's the, you know, these compassionate allowances. Fourth question, can you do the work that you did previously? Here's what they mean by that. At this step, we decide if your medical impairment prevents you pr from performing any of your past work. If it doesn't, we'll decide you don't have a qualifying disability. End of story, you're going to be denied. But if it does, uh, 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 you're not allowed to do the work you did previously, then uh, we can move to question number five, the final question, and this is it. Can you do any other type of work? What do they mean by that? Well, they're saying if you can't do the work you did in the past, uh, which means we answered that one. So we can go to question number five. Then they're going to say, uh, then we look to see if there's any other type of work that you could do despite your medical impairments. We consider your medical condition, age, education, past work experience, and any transferable skills that you may have. If you can't do other work, we'll decide you qualify for disability benefits. They'll make the decision. If you can do other work, we'll decide that you don't have this qualifying disability. We haven't made through all the questions, and your claim will be denied. All right, so those are the five different ways in which we can take our Social Security benefits. Again, like I said in the beginning, lots of questions, criteria, uh, but uh, you want to make sure that when you apply for Social Security, you're getting all the benefits that you can.